Screenplay formatting is very different from any other literary format, as you will know. There's a particular reason for that. It's not arbitrary. There's no torturer who at some point in history decided now we're going to make life hard for screenwriters as opposed to novelists. There are very good reasons why a screenplay looks the way it does. Now, there are aspects of it that could have been updated because as you look at the font that's being used, it looks very much like the old typewriter font. and That's uh, preserved for a reason. It is what we would call a non-proportionate font. It's a font where each letter takes the same amount of space. And that then equates to the duration of the film versus the page count. So that, that's one of the peculiarities about screenplay formatting that can be easily explained. And there are others, if you d dig into it, for every bizarre way of formatting scripts, there is a good reason underlying. And to move to advanced formatting, it's important that you at least try to understand why you're doing certain things. Because at some point you're going to break one of those many, many rules and you're going to, you're going to break that for good reason. Let's have a look at the topics we're going to discuss today. So, formatting basics. Why is the script there in the first place? Obviously, it's going to communicate your ideas as a screenwriter to the reader without the need or without the possibility to use pictures. You don't have the images at your disposal yet, so you need to convey your ideas in just words. And that's, that's a big challenge. Now, in order to keep everything within, you know, within reason, there is a common language that was developed over many, many years. Filmmaking started in 1895, the first scripts developed over that first decade. And there's a great video if you want to see what the origins are of the modern uh, screenplay. Just Google the origins of the contemporary uh, screenplay format. I think it's filmmaker IQ who created that video. It's worth watching it. Now, underlying all these rules and principles that you need to stick to, there are three basic qualities that you as a screenwriter need to achieve. Yes, Katie, that is spot on. That's a number one quality clarity. You need to be clear in what your intentions are, what you're trying to convey. Next. What comes next? Another word for brevity, concision. You gotta keep things short. In a screenplay, you try to get the message across in as few words as possible. You want that screenplay to be tight, to be crisp. The ideal length is somewhere around 100 pages. And I, I think uh, the, the, the range for beginning screenwriters is probably within 95 to 115 pages. Anything over that, people become reluctant to, re to read it. Anything under that, there's a chance, there's a risk that you don't have enough story material. A tightly written screenplay will have enough story material if you exceed the 90, 95 pages. Now, obviously, there are exceptions. If you're going to read great scripts, you'll come across lots and lots of them that run over 120, 130, even 140 pages. So yes, it is possible to tell great stories and break that sort of rules. Only when you're breaking in as a beginning screenwriter, it is difficult to convince readers that you're gonna you're gonna put it off, uh, pull it off. So they will prioritize scripts that are in a bracket that is easy easier to read. You know, a script of ninety pages reads more quickly than one hundred and forty. I have had scripts from uh, emerging screenwriters that ran for one hundred and ninety five pages. Now, as a consultant, I charge extra, and it's only fair because they take a lot, a lot more time to read. In fact because it is the mark of a beginning screenwriter, not only are the pages is going to be taking longer to read the, those pages, but each page in itself may pose problems. 
So that's why um, we, we're not particularly keen on reading scripts that run for longer than 120 uh, pages. So clarity, concision, and the third one is color. You need to develop your own style. You need to make the read interesting. And that's something once you move up to advanced standards of screenwriting, you can focus on how to do that uh, while even breaking some more all of the rules. And if I look at the, the Holy Grail, the script that I'm going to show you at the end of this session, you'll see that there um, a lot of rules are broken. So at the end of the tunnel, you have a lot of freedom. But first, you need to master all those rules because be before you decide to do something different, you need to know what impact that is going to have on the reader because the reader is expecting something. If you do something else, that will have an impact and you need to know what that impact is going to be. So, Clarity, concision, color, those are the primary basics. Those are the rules, the principles that guide everything else. All the, the formal, the material principles of uh, script formatting go back to those three points. And when you, when you write a script and when you read a script, every detail matters because everything on the page will be picked up by the eyes of the reader and we will draw some sort of conclusion from that, whether that's a misplaced comma or a missing slug line or the use of double dashes. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. It all matters. Um, oh yeah, that's right. There is, speaking of dashes, it seems like on our overview of today that was lacking. So we're going to talk about the use of dashes and the different sorts of dashes. Uh, and in what sort of cases you may be uh, reverting to those. I'm going to show you a page from a screenplay that was picked up um, and then reworked, but it became a very successful film, horror film, called A Quiet Place. Let's see. And that's about rules. It's about breaking rules. If you look at this page, there are a few rules broken. Halfway the page, the writer turns to writing a lot of caps. You see the monster stands between him and the shed. Obviously, that is for emphasis. Now, more emphasis, the caps are being underlined between him and his family. It's also a family film. It's a family horror film. And then you go to the final 25% of the page, it's all caps. The wind starts blowing, the leaves of the trees bend and rattle. It disguises the sound of John's footsteps and so forth. So here we break the rule of mixed case because in description you should only use mixed case. The writer is going to create an effect, impact by capitalizing everything. It's okay to do that for that purpose because it works. But you need to know that once you've done that, you can't do that again on the next page and the next page and the next page. So you need to use that technique sparingly. If you run out of caps or you, you, you run out of lines to use caps, you need to be creative. So what did this, did this writer do? He wanted to continue upping the ante. He wanted to continue putting more emphasis on the tension on what was happening in the scene. So now he isolates that final line. You see the final line of the page is isolated. There's a lot of space, white space preceding it. It is centered and it is also underlined. And immediately that one line gets even more impact than the preceding capitalized lines. The question obviously is where do you go from here? Because we're only on page 15 of this script. Um, your tool bag is running empty. You know, what, what is there left in order to create even more impact? Well, you've, you've got to be creative. And that's where sometimes writers need to break the rules. So what did this writer do? We go from page 15 to page 16. There's only one sentence. John is 30 feet away from the shed. And he continues in that in this way. So there'll be a number of pages with just one line. So you're turning pages rapidly in the screenplay. You want to know what's going to happen. There's an incredible tension. And it works. It works a treat. It's breaking a number of rules. But what the writer wants to achieve, which is ever-increasing tension, it works beautifully on the page. So here is a great example of advanced screenplay formatting 
that breaks rules at the right time, but at the same time, the writer is very much aware of how the reader will interpret this, what the impact is. And ultimately, you are writing for the reader. You're not writing for yourself. You're not writing for the audience either. The audience will never get to see your screenplay unless they're poor screenwriters who are trying to learn about the craft. They may have to read through that script at some point. But you're writing for a producer, you're writing for an agent, or you're writing for an assistant to a producer. And you need to know what sort of intention these people have with what sort of eyes they will read your script. Sadly, many of the assistants to producers are lowly paid, sometimes unpaid. Often they're beginning screenwriters. Often they are unaware of what can be done, what can be achieved, and they, they want to do their job properly. So they've read Robert McKee and they've read David Trotty's Screenwriter's Bible and they know the rules. And when those rules are broken in the script, they may frown and they may mark that script down in their report for the producer. That is a sad state of affair, but it will happen. Um, you need to be aware of that. It doesn't mean that you need to stick to all the rules when you write your script. What I'm going to show you now is two examples, um, both from the same film, but two drafts, different drafts, a first draft pre-shooting, what is more of a reader's draft, more of a marketing draft. And then we're going to compare that with the shooting draft, and you'll see the differences. They're, they're uh, quite significant. The script is um, No Country for Old Men by the Coen brothers. Katie, finally, it's made it into our class. And the first example here is a scan of the original. The Coen brothers are known for breaking a lot of screenplay formatting rules, and you can see it here, because it is barely looks like a screenplay. All that centered stuff, you wonder what is it? It doesn't seem to be dialogue, because if it were dialogue, there should have been character names above um, those lines, and there aren't any character names. But then when you read it, it's, it's apparent that this is actually dialogue. Now, it is much less cluttered. It is easier on the eye to read this. The script was not written for production. The script was written for financing. It was written for themselves and also for the studio bosses who have to give notes and, and help them uh, finance the film. And you, you see, it is crisp. It is, it is eminently readable, but there are critical elements missing. If you go all the way down, you see the deputy. Now, go a little bit up. The deputy slams the door. On the door, we, on the door slam, we cut to Texas highway racing under the lens, the landscape flat to the horizon, the siren whoops. Now, that's a transition embedded in a descriptive sentence. That's breaking with quite a few rules because there, sh there should have been a transition saying cut to, flush to the right, and then there should be a slug line indicating that we're now at a different location. And then we go to the character, the deputy, seated in the sheriff's office. Look, we're now in the sheriff's office. And none of that is clear from the technical elements. The technical elements are simply not there. You will not get away with this sort of writing. The Coen brothers do, because they know what they're doing. And they know why they're breaking these rules. When the script for No Country for Old Men made it to the Oscars and it was sent out for consideration to the members of the Academy, they got to see a whole different sort of script. More like the script that you need to write with all the technical elements in place. I'm going to show you the exact same sequence that you see here, but now in that properly formatted script. There you go. And this too is an official uh, script release. So they're, they're both the real thing. They're both the actual script for No Country of Old Men. One dating back to November uh, 2005, and this one is May 06, Blue Revision shooting draft. As you can see now, the dialogue all has character names saying voiceover, so it is a narrator. And if you go to the second page, you see we have a slug line there that cuts to scene four, interior, Sheriff Lamar's office day, and then the deputy set apart for emphasis. Now, there's still 
a little bit of freedom, a little bit of liberty taken. If you go up where it says on the door slam, we cut to Texas Highway racing under the lens, landscape flat to the horizon. So that is still um, slightly different from what you would expect. But at least it looks more like a script. This is the type of thing that you would write. By the way, this year, we're going to distribute all the screenplays that I use here in the masterclasses. So you can uh, look at them at your leisure, read them in, in their entirety if you wish. You can make further comparisons and that way uh, do further study because that is exactly what you need to do. If you want to make it to advanced screenwriting, you won't get, it, you won't get there by just doing these masterclasses or reading um, the screenwriter's Bible. You need to discover for yourself how these... Um, experienced writers deal with particular circumstances. Important part of script formatting is good knowledge of the elements. The elements are the slug line, action description, character, that's a character name, parenthetical or parentheses, dialogue, and transition. And then there are a few others that you won't use that often, such as insert or shot, but most can be done with the six main elements. And here's the list. Um, and I'll give you a few things to keep in mind as you are going to play with these slug lines, because they each pose certain challenges. In terms of the slug line, the, slug, the three elements that you know the slug line needs to contain is exterior, interior, we need to know where the camera is placed, and that has to do with the type of light the DOP will need to use. And then you give an indication of the type of location. What is the setting? Is it a house? Is it a field? Is it space? Is it part of a, a larger location? It could be a restaurant by the bar. All that information goes into slug line, yet you need to keep that slug line concise. So again, we go back to those three principles of clarity, concision, and color. So you want to keep that slug line tight and short, uh, yet it needs to keep the most important information. If, it, if you are compress, you feel like you're compressing too much in that slug line, you need to see if you can drop some of it into the description. Speaking of the description, that's where your talent will shine. That's where great screenwriters show their skill. Because most of the experience for the reader will lie in the description. Different writers have different styles. Some writers overwrite, others are ultra lean. Remember our class about screenwriting style when we looked at um, Christopher Nolan's style compared to Walter Hill or James Cameron. They each have their own descriptive style. It's almost like people say about Shakespeare. You give someone a line of a character without saying who it is, the true Shakespeare no, uh, you know, connoisseur will be able to tell you which character is speaking. In the same way, if you look at the line of description from one of the greatest screenwriters, you will instantly detect whose style it is. You will, you will um, uh, tell apart Woody Allen from Aaron Sorkin or Quentin Tarantino. Uh, or James Cameron, and definitely Walter Hill. So description is what you need to learn, and that's why the immersion screenwriting course is so important, because that's exactly what we focus on more than anything else. From description, we go to character. That's, in essence, really simple. It's just the name of the character, yet it's important that you keep consistent. You use one name, you stick to that name. A few pointers there. Use the character name that is used by the characters in dialogue. So it's easy for the reader to identify uh, who they're talking about. If the character is called Mrs. Hill, then don't call her Angela in the character name. So be consistent. So we can easily uh, match the characters with the people that are being talked about. Similarly, when you have a character who appears at different ages in your screenplay, pick the one, pick the age that is most common. If two-thirds of the screenplay shows the adult Harry and one-third shows us young Harry, then call him young Harry in the first third and just Harry in the next two-thirds. And that way you distinguish the two because they may be played by different actors, and it's important to get that in the script reports as different, different um, characters. 
Um, and, and do that consistently for, for each character. So be aware that ultimately producers are going to run character reports. So they will run a list of all the characters that appear. If you have one typo in each of your characters' names, then you're doubling the list of characters. Because each typo will create a new character and it will show up in, in, that, in that list, in that report. And that's why it is so important that your scripts are that, immaculate. You cannot have typos in these elements. And that is that's part of advanced screenwriting. You need to, you need to get there. Parenthetical, that's that the brackets underneath the character, there shouldn't be too many in your screenplay. You know what they're used for. They're used to indicate the tone or the style in which the line is spoken. They can be used for, for foreign languages. Once you are a confident, experienced screenwriter, you may get away by also using that parenthetical for a little bit of action. Typically, it's frowned upon. Every screenwriting teacher will say you're not allowed to put action in parentheticals, but the best screenwriters do it because it is elegant. You get away with it here and there, but you don't do it consistently. So parenthetical, use it sparingly, know what it is used for, also called the Rileys. And then dialogue, there's not much to be said about dialogue because dialogue is what it is. Your skill is in choosing the words that go in the dialogue. The formatting of dialogue is really straightforward. It just needs to flow. It needs to continue. You start typing and you just keep typing. You do not insert white space in dialogue. That's not how it is done. If you want to create a pause, you can do that by adding an ellipsis or a parenthetical that says a beat. Um, you can use those parentheticals in the middle of dialogue to pace your dialogue in that way by creating um, moments of rest or pauses. And finally, we have transition. Transition used to always be written in the script. Now it is rapidly going out of fashion and transitions such as cut to are just forgotten. Now we're going to look at a few examples where that transition comes back into the script in a more elegant way. Because ultimately, the number one criterion for a good screenplay at your level, in terms of getting scripts out there, getting them read and being recognized as a beginning screenwriter, as a, a, a competent screenwriter, the number one criterion is readability. So you're going to use all these elements to the benefit of making the script readable. Obviously, they're technical, and once the crew uses your script as a blueprint for production, they're going to use that in a more systematic way. They'll look at slug lines and look at all the, you know, the different locations, but you're not there yet. At this point, you need to make sure that all these six technical elements still contribute to readability. I'm going to show you the first page of a script that's going to be offered for consideration for the Oscars uh, around these days. And ironically, it's not the type of writing that I would recommend, but it is the type of scripts that you get to read and that may confuse you. It's a Belgian co-production called Sound of Metal. And you're immediately overwhelmed here with an abundance of text. It's a wall of text. And that's not what people t typically love reading. So you'd, you'd break that up. So in terms of readability, these, uh, these artists are not, not scoring very highly. Why is that? Probably because they made it to this point in other ways. This is not a script with which you break into the industry. And you need to be cautious when you read scripts. You need to know where they come from. You need to know who has written them. What have these people done previously? They may have gotten to the point of being able to get their scripts on the desk of, write, of, of producers in other ways. You know, they, they may be writer-directors. They may be auteurs who have a style that is hot. So be, be very cautious before you look at a screenplay as an example. Know why... It, uh, who wrote it and um, why they are breaking these, these sort of principles. It's almost half hour or halfway this class. I'm going to stop the share for a minute. I'm going to see if you guys are still with me. 
and whether you might have any questions at this point. So, um, yeah, let us know how you're going. Louise, you've got a question here. Looks like the scenes are actually numbered in the screen. Is that new? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. It's a really good question. The most common advice here is when you send out a script for reading, you don't number the scenes because it adds to the cluttering. You know, it's not as crisp. Um, having said that, if you, you're working with a producer, so once you're in a working relationship, it's handy to have those scene numbers there. If you know, you're going to have it assessed, I would recommend to keep the, the scene numbers in there for reference. But typically, they would not be put in because it doesn't really make the page look better. That question, but also on the last script, um, I felt like I was reading a novel. So which script was this? The last one, the big chunks of co uh, coffee. Yeah, yeah. It looked like a novel, so it kind of didn't really work in my head. That's a good point. That's a, that's a really good point. It didn't look like a screenplay. And there are certain scripts that read like novels. Yesterday I mentioned the Alfonso Cuaron script for Roma, the, one of the first Netflix films that made it uh, into the Oscar nominations. And you read that script and it doesn't, it doesn't read like a script at all. And I put it down. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to read it. But I knew that I was going to love the film. I, I watched the film and I loved it. It's a, it's a piece of auteur cinema. And you need to be able to identify that. If you're going to read a screenplay for, an, for, for a Stanley Kubrick film, you cannot assess that script on the same basis as any other script. Kubrick is an auteur. You need to know that. And that goes for every auteur. They get away with different things. The reason these films break in have very little to do with the strength of the screenplay. These are not scripts that make that help writers break into the industry and and i would even go further and say if you have a, a, an auteur type of attitude you shouldn't be a screenwriter you should be a director you should write your stuff and film it and get it out and be noticed before you go um, finding money you need to convince people of your skills before but you know you don't need to worry about that because you guys are writers Louise, uh, sorry, Nolene asks, how do you break up a line that you want to emphasize? Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that in a minute, Nolene. Uh, that's the, the dash issue and the, or the double dash issue. You know, if you have any, of, any such, you know, peculiarities, any sort of detailed questions, this is the class you ask them. Sorry, Carol, could I ask, ask a that? question? Yeah, I was just, you mentioned this, this screenwriter's Bible. Is that a, a book you'd recommend for us to, to buy or read? Or It's the standard. It's the only real standard about script writing out there. Um, it's written by Dr. David Trottier. It's updated every few years. It is, I think, if, if you're in doubt about anything, that's the book you will consult. Uh, it will give you a solid basis. Now, it is still a basis. The book covers screenwriting in general, but it is most highly um, acclaimed because of its fourth chapter that deals with formatting and style. Um, my view, you can safely ignore everything else because you can learn that elsewhere, probably better. But David Trotter is the authority when it comes to uh, formatting. Now, I don't think the book goes into the area of advanced formatting, and it's very difficult because that book would be a very big book um, because there's, there's so many cases that you can imagine, and it, it really requires consistent reading. You need to read dozens of screenplays before you get to that level where you can transcend those basic rules because advanced screenwriting, I would say, is more about breaking rules and knowing where to break them than to follow them. So the basics are in the screenwriter's Bible. If you want to move up to advanced formatting, that's where you read as many scripts as you can and you start breaking the rules to develop your own style, yet create an even more readable screenplay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, by the way, the Screenwriter's Bible is now also available since a few years as an e-book. Before that, you can, you can only buy the big 
uh, hard copy, but now you can also get it as a as a Kindle or a, or an ebook. But yes, I think every screenwriter should have that on their desk to just cover the basics. That's where you go. Uh, Dr. Trottier also publishes articles about specific cases, about challenges, about more advanced techniques. And I think he even has an, a PDF somewhere where he bundles a number of those instances. That's kind of like an addition, a supplement to the, uh, the basic work. So check all that out. It will help you. Let's go back to our wonderful slideshow. And I'm going to share the screen again. And I have a few special cases for you. First of all, oh, there's the whole list again. I need to break that up. Di we're going to talk about dual dialogue. We're going to talk about flashbacks, singing in films, revisions, montage, complex slug lines, and then those signs at the bottom that's actually a hyphen, an N dash, an M dash, and an ellipsis. This is from the script for Midsummer. The Ariasta film, horror film, a, a folk horror film that was quite successful, I think, last year. And he uses du dual dialogue here more than you would uh, see in any other film. Dual dialogue is often used very, or mostly used very sparingly, because it is not easy to read. It's hard to imagine how the words would cross and how characters would talk over one another. But the reason I wanted to show you this is how he staggers the first lines of these characters. So Danny st uh, starts speaking and Christian only uh, comes in over the third line. And the same again further down where Christian starts talking and then Danny speaks over him. So the staggering of the dual dialogue, I'd say that is an interesting advanced technique. Do you always need to write everything characters say in this instance? You could just write what you hear and then give the, the actors uh, the full script. Because ultimately, again, remember, your script needs to be ultimately readable. It's not a production screenplay. So you can keep those separate. You can keep a production script um, uh, for when the script is greenlit, when the film is greenlit. This is from Zootopia. It's a way of writing flashbacks. Now, Dr. David Trottier will say that a flashback you write by just writing a normal slug line, say, exterior cornfield, day, hyphen, a flashback, for instance. Here, this is done in a much more elegant way, using the inclusion of a transition. You see how it says, off Munch's look, we cut to a flashback. Munch's is driving when he's attacked from the back seat. And then the car spins out. Emmett growls, growls at Munch's, then runs off back to the canopy. So it flows really elegantly, and it doesn't have those full slug lines that would break up the, the flow of the action. Yet it is clear that something's going on because flashback and the canopy are both bolded. So we see that that section in between is isolated. And yet it reads as one sentence. And I thought that was a really elegant and really smart way of, at the same time, preserving the technical element of the flashback, but keeping the script very readable. If you search the web for the script for the film Frozen, the animation, the DreamWorks animation that was incredibly successful. I think at some point it was the number one animation of all time. You will get two versions, one in black and one that has these blue sections. The one that's just black uh, feels a little bit cluttered, uh, yet I believe it is an official draft. This is the one that was offered for consideration at Oscar time. And here you see the blue is where the characters sing. These are the songs in the film. And it makes it really clear. The first time you see this, it may confuse at first sight. You might think these are revisions because revisions are often indicated in color. You can decide in, in most professional screenwriting software, you can choose the color in which revisions are made. And usually the first revision is blue, the blue revision, and it's this type of blue. But in this particular shooting script, Blue means songs, and the songs are also capitalized. It is clear because it is indi indicated with the title, The Frozen Heart. 
Now we're going to a script by one of the uh, the naughty boys, the enfant terrible in the film. This is Charlie Kaufman's script for I'm Thinking of Ending Things. The cover page indicates this is the yellow revision, dating back to March 2019. And this gives you an insight in how these revisions work. So it's a combination. You have the white, the blue, the pink, and then the yellow revision. That's the latest one. And in the script itself, the, the, those places that have revisions will be marked with asterisks uh, or revision marks on the right-hand side. The script opens with a montage, POV montage. And then it is written as a normal script. So each scene has its own slug line as it should. The only thing here that I would say you might do differently is you need to put a full stop after the INT or the EXT in the slug line. Uh, leaving it out doesn't really look professional, but again, it's Charlie Kaufman, he gets away with it. And you see that within the montage, he sets apart the individual shots with a bullets using hyphens. So each hyphen indicates a new shot as an element in this montage. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Actually, quite classically formatted script, if you ask. And it has the C numbers, as you can tell. The next page, we see quite a few omitted scenes. When you cut a scene, you don't just select the text and delete it. No, you're going to omit the scene. What that does is it actually prefer, uh, preserves all the data. It preserves all the text, but it hides it. So that if you were to, you would need, you know, you, you would need to bring it back later. You can do that. You can reopen that scene, or even move it. And uh, at the end of today's class, Aaron Foy will talk about omissions a bit as well. And to end these examples, I want to show you what I consider one of the finest screenplays of recent times. It breaks so many rules, but it does it so expertly that you can only dream of achieving this level of expertise. It's Dan Gilroy's script for Nightcrawler, dating back to 2012. And you look at the first, play, uh, first page of the script, and immediately you see that this is something quite special. Infinity of stars. No slug line to open. Infinity of stars. New line over barren ground, if not for a billboard. Reading, and then boom, you have these uh, extraordinary... Uh, font letters in, in a font that's not acceptable but it's done could be the moon camera pushing over a rim to show Los Angeles and here each of these would have been full slug lines but he doesn't do that he makes it super readable by just having the single words and if you read down that page it feels like it's just one sentence he's telling you the story and he doesn't stop and you can't stop reading it's done so beautifully, and each important element, as you can see, is isolated for emphasis. The Coyote, the LA River, Louis Bloom, our main character, the headlights of the car approaching, the, the movement, the light sweep, and then we see pickup truck. And then the next page continues that style, emphasizing Lou, our main character. Wonderful, wonderful script. A real fun, real joy to read. And then this. This is the script that uh, I didn't use yesterday. And I want to show you here the use of double dashes. A whole different, a whole range of possible uses of the double dash. And in, in normal text, what I mean by that is not in script formatting, not in courier, but in any other writing software, you can use n dash and m dash. These, these are longer hyphens. On the Mac, you create them by doing option hyphen option minus and shift option minus. And the, the, the hyphen gets longer each time. But because Courier is like a typewriter, in a typewriter, you only had the one sign. What we do is where we wanted a longer hyphen, we put a double dash. And you'll see here, um, um, Mangold, James Mangold in his script for Logan uses double dash in, this, in the, the slug line. 
it's not unusual. You'll find quite a few writers love the double dash so much they use it in the uh, slug line. And someone at some point told me that some studios have that as a standard. I don't know if that's uh, the case. But you also see the double dash in that first description. A beautiful couple dance on a giant can of a Red Bull-like drink and then double dash hypno. There the double dash sits straight to the word, so there's no space. It interrupts, and this is exactly what we do in dialogue as well. We use a double dash to interrupt dialogue, and we don't put a space before it. So we've got two uses here already, one in the slug line, one for interruption. Go further down the page. We go to the bottom. The dialogue starts with an ellipsis, and the ellipsis indicates a pause. And then the final ellipsis, you're going to strip them, plating flakes off, you know, and then dot, dot, dot. There's no double dash. A double dash would mean an interruption. Uh, an ellipsis, dot, 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 would mean the trailing off of the dialogue. It's the character themselves who are slowing down or trailing off. And then we go to the next page and the dialogue continues. And there we have another example of an interruption. No one wants to pay to write in a... And then we've got the interruption, the jittery banger fires, blows Logan right off his feet. So the double dash here used as an interruption. But immediately there's another double dash. You see how much James, Goldman, uh, James Mangold loves the double dash. The next line starts with one. For emphasis, um, and later on, you know, we go to the bottom of the page, we see yet another use of double dash to create tension. The bangers react to Logan with bafflement, ad lib Spanish reactions, nervous chuckles, space, double dash. That is to create a transition to the next shot or to create tension, to create a bit of mystery. And then again, the final double dash feels like an interruption, but it could just as much be um, a typo here. I think he would have probably meant to include a space. Throwing at his bad hand when space and then double dash. So these are all uses of double dash. Now, I skip over the italics, and that's an interesting one. So the italics here are a note from the writer to the reader. After that initial dialogue, he says, now might be a good time to talk about fights described in the next hundred or so pages. And then he gives us some background about the style of this film. So this is not a Marvel film in the traditional sense. Logan is a very different film. It's, it's more a drama rather than a superhero movie. And he wants to set that straight. He does that in this note that is quite fun to read. And it, it, it is all about clarity. You know, it's, you can argue this is, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of concision here, but clarity is more important. So if, if you're concerned that your reader may not get the tone of the script, it is perfectly legitimate to add a note of this kind to the script. All right, going into our final segment for today, and that's geeking out with Aaron about advanced screenwriting formatting techniques using Final Draft. Erin Foy is a long-term student of my classes. She recently worked on some Australian uh, TV drama. She was in the writer's room as various uh, in various functions as a script coordinator um, among others and in that position she had to use some of the super advanced features of final draft we won't bore you with the the extreme stuff but uh, she's got a few interesting pointers and her first bit is about the elements a big one for me to you know like i use a lot was the elements um, when we moved into shooting scripts, uh, you know, often you would you would change the um, character header to bold. Um, if the writers hadn't done it, you'd change the scene header to bold and underlined. Um, and I also would often use it to set up a cast list underneath the scene header. Um, there is an automatic um, cast list in Final Draft, but it doesn't list, and again, I'm saying it from what I know, from what I understand and from what I've played around with, it doesn't, if you activate the automatic cast list, it will list people who are speaking in that scene, but not non-speaking extras or other people that we needed listed in the cast list. And if you put them in manually, 
it very quickly deletes them for you and you move your cursor off. The second part, is she talks about the Australian format. Um, just a little one that I learned on this job is that in Australia, we use the A4 uh, page layout, not the US letter, um, which I think was in documents and then page layout. So, I, you know, just kind of made sure I was changing that on every script. Um, headers, which again, not anything majorly complicated, but you are constantly changing the header every time you do an amendment or every time you get a new script in. So knowing how to just, you know, do that. Now with, with header, Aaron means the, the, the top part of the page as opposed to the footer. So you can put the same information on each, each page in the header or the footer. And when you send out your script or for a production copy, it's really important that all the information is in that header. What doesn't seem to be advanced formatting, but something that's worth reminding you of is to make safety copies of your scripts. So yeah, so locking pages, editing locked page numbers, um, setting up, which is a simple thing, but setting up, knowing how to set up your final draft to auto save in a file that you know where, a folder that you know where it is and can easily access, which is sounds super simple to most tech savvy people. But again, wasn't something that I knew when I was... Um, using Final Draft and I used it a lot when if I did alt, I normally was pretty good at saving copies when I was about to do something risky that I didn't quite know was going to work. I'd always save a, save a copy, but if I ever didn't, it was handy to know where the last, you know, the, th the auto save from three minutes to go was, was. And then finally, Aaron talks about that uh, element we saw on the Charlie Kaufman screenplay where scenes are omitted. Only she goes into uh, one step further, the advanced way of omitting scenes. Because often we would omit scenes. We'd omit that scene, but we'd actually just, it was really moving a scene, but because they were locked. So you, so what I learned is when, it, when you manually, when, sorry, when you omit a scene and you go omit scene, it comes up with omitted. Um, you then can, you can then just tailor that to say admitted, uh, omitted, sorry, um, scene moved to 47A, you know, so if there was, if a scene was at scene 30 and we now decided we wanted it later in the script, you'd omit scene 30 and then you'd write omitted dash scene contents moved to 47A. And then of course, 47A, you could, you just have a normal, you know, scene header and explain what it was. So yeah, omitted, but you can always, it, it keeps its scene number. Once the scene, once the scripts are locked, everything, the scene numbers don't change unless they're, again, unless they're becoming A's or omitted or ones. I was going to about to say, no, it's a pay. Yeah, unless they're becoming one or two, no, letters. Unless they're becoming C and D scenes as well. You can have those as well, yeah. It, it gets quite complicated. When you insert a page, you want to keep the old page count. You don't want to change the whole uh, pagination of your script. Yet you need to insert a, a page and that still needs to have its own page number. So that then becomes 27A instead of 28 because you already have a 28. So all those things matter once your script goes into production. And um, it may not be a problem today, but you better know that it may be coming one day. So I hope that was useful. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions left, now's the time. How are we going? So after a flashback, after the exterior cornfield day dash flashback, when you go back to the regular scene, do you have to put like the slug line and then end flashback or just the slug line of whatever the scene was? You are at advanced stage, Katie. That's a smart okay. question. Because yes, David Trottier would say um, back to scene or you can just leave it out because when it doesn't say flashback, it means it's no longer flashback. But, so by leaving out the flashback, it indicates that the flashback is over. But remember clarity. Some people like the clarity as you would say back to scene. Some people would leave out the whole slug line and just print back to scene. So there are a number of ways and you need to find which way fits best with your writing style because there are a whole lot of other things that you will have chosen to use and to incorporate in your style. And then when the flashbacks arrive, you need to make sure that they're kind of consistent with the style that you've already set up. If you have a beautiful, uh, crisp, tight writing style, you don't want to have that full length slug line there. Christopher Nolan would do that. You wouldn't do that. Good question. Any others? That was all clear then, I guess.
All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. And um, you'll have the opportunity to have a closer look at those scripts as we send them uh, out with uh, the email that's coming over the next few days. And I'm looking forward to having you again next weekend for our next masterclass. In the meantime, enjoy the weekend, enjoy the week. I'll see you later. Bye. Thanks.